Welcome to Time Bomb. I'd like to switch focus this week to another water-related crisis that could have major ramifications for the United States. The Panama Canal, through which 40% of container goods sold in America travels, currently has a 21-day wait time for ships attempting to make the crossing, and the situation will only get worse before it gets better. Also this week, thanks to last winter's above-average snowpack, the Bureau of Reclamation has reduced water restrictions for the lower Colorado River Basin states. I'll talk about that more later in this video, but first, let's take a look at that situation in Panama. The number of vessels waiting to cross the Panama Canal currently stands at over 150 ships. This pileup is the result of the reduction in the number of vessels allowed to transit the canal each day, specifically the very large Panamax and Neo-Panamax ships. By the way, Panamax and Neo-Panamax are terms used for the largest vessels that fit into the Panama Canal's locks. Panamax ships are the largest vessels that will fit through the Panama Canal's original locks, and Neo-Panamax or New Panamax vessels are the largest vessels that will fit into the, the New Canal's third set of locks. These are much larger than the original two, and they opened in June of 2016. There's also post-Panamax ships that are too large to fit through the Panama Canal entirely. Not only has the Panama Canal Authority cut the number of vessels that can pass through the canal each day, but they've also reduced by 40% the weight limit or the amount of cargo each vessel can carry. All of these actions, the new draft restrictions, the reduced number of crossings, the reduced number of booking slots, it's all due to low water levels. While droughts in the Panama region have typically impacted the canal once every five years or so, they are becoming more common, and this year, it's been the driest year on record since 1950. So how does drought impact the Panama Canal? Well, unlike the Suez Canal, which spans entirely at sea level, the Panama Canal employs an intricate system of locks. These locks raise and lower ships as they travel through the Panamanian landscape. And for these locks to work, they need water and the Panama Canal sources its water from two man-made lakes, Lake Gatun and Lake Alahuela. Alahuela. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. If not, please let me know in the comments. But every time a ship passes through these locks, it prompts the discharge of as much as 50 million gallons of fresh water from these two reserves. Once the fresh water departs from the locks, it is lost to either the Pacific or Atlantic Ocean forever. Both Lakes Gatun and Alajuela were formed by the damming of the Charges River early in the 20th century when the Panama Canal was built. Traditionally, if water levels at these lakes declined, the Panama Canal Authority, who operates the canal, would have no choice but to limit the size and number of ships that could transit the canal. This is why there's over 150 ships waiting to transit the canal today. Vessels that were already on the way to the canal, but are heavier than the new draft limits, will need to find some way to offload weight before making the crossing. And the reduction in traffic is already forcing some tankers, like petroleum vessels, to reroute their cargo all the way around South America. It's hard to underestimate just how critical the Panama Canal is for the United States. Representing 73% of canal traffic, the United States is by far the largest user of the Panama Canal. In fact, over 40% of all U.S. container traffic travels through the canal every year. That's about $270 billion in cargo. Only time will tell how this situation will impact prices in the United States. Energy companies are already diverting vessels away from the Panama Canal, and we all know how quickly that'll be reflected at the gas pump. Now let's take a look at what led us to this point. Drought is a recurring challenge for Panama. Over the course of the canal's history, whenever the water level at Lake Gatun dropped below 79 feet, the canal authority would impose draft limits, reducing the amount of cargo sh the ships could carry through the canal. Given this history, you might wonder, why wasn't drought mitigation addressed during the canal's expansion? Back in 2006, the official proposal for the expansion of the Panama Canal was submitted. I put a link to this document in the video description in case you want to take a look. It is an interesting read. In this document, they specifically state that no new reservoirs will be required to support the new third set of locks. Instead, the plan laid out in the proposal was to build reutilization basins deep in Lake Gatun and elevate the lake's maximum operational level. Unfortunately, as we now know, these efforts did not add enough water capacity to the system, and we now face even larger weight restrictions and stricter limits on the number of large vessels that can traverse the canal. 
For its part, the Panama Canal Authority has implemented a few measures to help the current situation. They suspended power generation at the Gatun hydroelectric power plant. They also implemented a process called cross-filling lockages, a technique that sends water between the two lanes at the Panamax locks during transits, saving more water. Although these me measures do help the situation, they are far from a long-term solution. This chart shows the average water level at Lake Gatun over the past five years. The water level typically bottoms out in April and May and then begins to increase again in June. This year, however, the water levels at Lake Gatun have continued to decline throughout the summer months. The current elevation is 79.6 feet. That's over five and a half feet below the average for the month of August. The record low of 78.3 feet was set on June 18th of 2016. At this point, there's no rain on the horizon, and there are no plans to construct an additional reservoir, so we may be dealing with this situation in Panama for a while. Of course, I'll do my best to keep you updated. Now let's switch our focus back over to the Colorado River. On August 8th, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation announced Lake Mead and the Lower Colorado River will operate in a Tier 1 water shortage for 2024. While that's a vast improvement over this year's first ever Tier 2 shortage, it underscores the extent of the severity of the Colorado River crisis. The tier system I'm referring to is a plan that was initially laid out in the 2007 Colorado River Interim Guidelines Agreement. That agreement has been amended over the years to give us the system we have in place today. This system was designed in response to the ever-declining water levels in both Lake Powell and Lake Mead. The goal was to establish a structured system that would ensure fair distribution of water reductions among the lower basin states. This distribution would help stabilize water levels during times of scarcity. This chart shows how much water in acre feet each state must contribute based on the tier level. In 2023, we were in a tier two shortage, so a majority of the contributions, 592,000 acre feet, came from Arizona. Nevada contributed 25,000 and Mexico 104,000 acre feet. Next year, under the tier one water restrictions, Arizona's contribution will decline slightly to 512,000 acre feet. Nevada's will decline by 1,000 acre feet and Mexico will fall to 80,000 acre feet. I always find it interesting that California does not have to contribute anything under these plans until the water restrictions fall to a tier two B or a tier three level. That is the advantage of holding senior water rights. Well, thanks for joining me. As always, thanks for watching. I'll be back with another video next week. In the meantime, check out some of my other videos. Please consider subscribing to my channel, hit the like button, leave a comment. I really could use all the support I could get. Thank you so much.